Persimmons are a funny fruit. Native North American persimmons grow really well in cold climates. They ripen early to late fall. But here's the funny part. How do you know that they're ready? Well, you wait for the fruit to fall to the ground, and then you know it's ripe. Now, that fruit may not necessarily look appealing, but it can taste really sweet and delicious if you harvest it just at the right time. North American persimmons can also be a little bit small, so they're kind of like a tasty mini snack. Then there are the Asian persimmons. These trees grow in warmer climates and they produce fruit that can ripen maybe earlier, that tastes a bit sweeter, and that fruit can stay on the tree long after the leaves fall to the ground in the fall. Now, while native persimmons are often dried or cooked, Asian persimmons are terrific, fresh, right off the tree. Now, wouldn't it be lovely to have Asian persimmons that grow in cooler climates too? That's a thought that many plant breeders have had, and they've been quietly working away to develop natural hybrid persimmons that can grow in various different climates. And that is what we're going to talk about on the show today with my guest, Darren Bender Beauregard of Brambleberry Farm in Indiana. He and his wife, Esprit, operate a regionally focused plant nursery where they propagate and sell hundreds of different species and cultivars of edible and useful plants. So Darren, welcome to the show today. Thank you. Good to be here. So tell me, let's start off with the American persimmon. All I know is it's kind of this strange puckered looking fruit that tastes great if you harvest it at the right time, but can taste a little nasty if you harvest it at the wrong time. Tell me a little bit about it. Well, like you said, people that live in persimmon country where the wild American persimmon grows probably have a story in their lifetime of eating an unripe persimmon. And an unripe persimmon is full of tannins that will make your mouth almost feel like it's shedding a lining of its skin. It's, and it lasts for, you know, a good five to 10 minutes. Um, and you don't usually forget it very quickly. They, around here, they talk about it being a cotton mouth, cotton mouthy feeling. So that's the biggest thing. And most people, you know, are very clear about how you need to wait till the persimmons fall to the ground and are soft before you eat them. Well, we have a, an email already from Francis. Francis writes, good afternoon, Susan. Are persimmons a sweet fruit or bitter? They kind of look like a tomato. Thank you. They are a very sweet fruit. In fact, the persimmon is, I think, second only to the avocado in terms of the amount of calories per gram of fruit from a tree fruit in the whole world. So they have an incredibly high carbohydrate value. They're full of sugars. Um, they do look like little tomatoes and they are soft like a very ripe tomato. The skin's very fragile on the American persimmons at least. And um, they're just almost like a little bag of orange candy. It's almost too sweet. When I first moved to Southern Indiana, I had never grown up with persimmons and I wasn't real crazy about eating them fresh when I first moved here. It's a little bit of an acquired taste um, because they are so sweet that it's almost just too much to eat fresh because there's not a lot of other real fruity flavors in them. Um, but as you you know, many, many other things the same way. If, when you're around them, the longer you're around them, the more I appreciate eating them fresh in the fall and trying the different flavors and different colors and textures and all the different types of American persimmons. Just to clarify, with American persimmons, do you actually harvest them from the ground or do you wait for them to fall, a few of them to fall, and then you go harvest the rest from the tree? That's a good question. You definitely want to wait for them to fall. Uh, when they are still on the tr tree, there are some varieties that you can safely pick from the tree if you know what you're doing and know how soft the fruit is. But as a general rule, you want to wait till they fall. Um, and one issue with that is because they're so sweet, deer and raccoons and possums and all kinds of wildlife are going to be eating them as well. So you will either not get very many 
um, or the ones you do get, you need to be careful because there is a lot of scat from those animals right next to the persimmons that you're harvesting. So generally with food safety guidelines, you want to somehow sterilize the fruit before um, eating it raw or um, make sure whatever you do, you cook, you cook, if you make pulp from the fruit, you want to use that in baked goods. And if it's cooked, it's, it's okay and safe. Now, there are some people, I'm, I don't know the details, but there are some people who have devised net systems that catch the fruit when it falls and it funnels them into a bucket or a trough. In that case, you can get by without worrying about contamination from um, animal scat. So. Wow, that is interesting. Very different from growing apple trees and, and other fruits where you really are discouraged uh, from picking fruit up off the ground. You know, that's not, you know, that's for the animals. That's not for the humans. We've got a question here from Mark. Mark is from Quebec. Mark writes, American persimmon seedlings are supposed to be hardy to zone four in Canada but will mainly ripen in zone five and fruits are supposed to supposed not to be very good tasting. What are all the alternatives for those who wish to try growing persimmons in zone four? And, and uh, so Mark says meter, muller, those are a couple of names of varieties. He, Mark says, I also heard and read about deer luscious and full draws as well. What is your opinion about those four mentioned for Northern climates like ours in Canada? Yes, I think your best bet is to find cultivars that you can graft onto your trees or buy grafted trees. Because if you plant seedlings, um, as is the same with most fruits, you're gonna get a variety of different individuals with different types of fruit, different ripening times, different cold hardiness, and different flavors. And with persimmons, you're very correct that they, the plant itself can be hardy to zone four, but if it's a late ripening type of persimmon, there will never be enough warmth and growing days for that fruit to ripen in zone four. So what you need to find is early ripening varieties that have cold hardiness. And meter has been a real common one that people grow up north and molar is a much harder to find variety anymore, but that is supposed to be a good one. Um, there's a number, the person you should talk to if you want a lot of details and go down the rabbit hole is Buzz Ferber with Perfect Circle Farm. It's perfectcircle.farm. He is in Vermont in zone four. Him and I are good friends and we trade cyanwood back and forth. And he is trialing a whole bunch of cultivars that are grafted as well as seedlings from different cultivars in zone four to see what will survive and what will fruit in unprotected conditions. That's great advice. Okay, super. Uh, we've got an email here from Catherine. Hi, Susan. What are the best tasting and cold hardy American persimmons or hybrids that I could grow in zone 5B in Canada, which is zone 4 US? How should I graft a five-year-old male American persimmon with females? My, sp my four spring grafts didn't take and I'm usually good at grafting, thank you. Okay, so Catherine is talking about male and female trees, grafting them together. So what's your answer for her? Great question. So yes, persimmon trees come in general as either male or female trees. They're separate. And the female trees are the only ones that will produce fruit. There are many exceptions as usual in nature, persimmons maybe more so but we won't get into that right now. The thing that you need to know though, is that it is totally fine to graft female persimmons onto male rootstock and vice versa. They intergraft just fine. The trick though with grafting persimmons, and I've had the mistake that you've had and many of us had, that have grafted other fruit trees like apples and pears and cherries and peaches. We generally graft those in February, March, April, the very cold months. And we usually graft them before the rootstocks leaf out. Persimmons, and I also say pawpaws in my experience, are much better to wait 
until it's warm. Mm -hmm. So Darren, talk to me a little bit now about Asian persimmons. How are they different from the American persimmons? So the Asian persimmons grow in much warmer climates and cannot handle colder climates. Generally, the rule of thumb is you can't grow Asian persimmons um, below zone seven, USDA zone seven, seven. Many of us are growing them in zone 6B. We are in zone 6B, uh, US zone 6B, um, and having pretty much fine luck, except for the very, very coldest winters when they get a little bit of damage on them. Uh, but Asian persimmons in general do not get to be as large of trees as American persimmons, generally, you know, 15 feet or less. Um, they have much wider and glossier leaves and beautiful fall color. Asian persimmons, if you can grow them, are wonderful edible landscaping trees because they're just beautiful in all seasons. Um, their leaves have some of the most beautiful fiery oranges and reds and yellows that I've seen. And then the fruits hanging on are just like, look like ornaments, you know, orange or red or yellow hanging on this tree without leaves sometimes. So, um, so that's one difference. The other major difference is that Asian persimmons do not fall when they're ripe. They are more like an apple or a peach, probably more like a peach because they have to be, most of them have to be soft when to eat them or they'll have that astringency, that cotton mouthy um, quality to their fruit. Now there are some Asian persimmons that are called non-astringent. And those are types that you can actually pick when they are hard like an apple and they do not have the tannins that most persimmons have. So those you can eat and you slice them like an apple. They're great in fruit salads. Um, they're just, but they're very different. Most persimmons are very gooey and messy and um, liquidy and very sweet, but the, the non-astringent types um, have a very delicate, light, very light flavor, lightly sweet. They're just a really nice, pleasant um, fruit in my opinion. So we have an email here from Shirley, and Shirley writes, I absolutely adore persimmons and will buy them whenever I see them at the store. So excited for this episode. That's Shirley from Kitchener, Ontario. Now, but, uh, you know, the ones we see at the store are going to be Asian persimmons, am I right? That is and they're correct. the ones that you talk about that they're a little bit firmer. Um, you'll see them in like if you've got a local Chinese or Asian mm -hmm. fruit store, that's where you get those beautiful, delicious mm -hmm. persimmons. So here we've talked about you've got the American persimmons, they grow well in cold climates. You've got the Asian persimmons, if you're lucky enough to live in a warmer climate, seven and above or six, if you're really trying. <laughs> Um, so tell me about when people started to think in terms of can we hybridize these so we get delicious fruits that grow in colder climates or a little bit more flexibility? Yeah, so I am not the best person for like history and dates, but I know it was, I think, in the 80s that some breeders in Russia and Ukraine, I believe they were the first ones to be really attempting this. Uh, and I'm sorry that I don't have names. Again, I'm not the best with, you know, geeking out on all the history, but, um, but they were successful in breeding um, a number of varieties, but the two that came out of that, that at least made it to the U.S. are two varieties that are the longest known hybrid persimmons in the United States. And I should probably, before I get too far back up, yes, the goal is to find a more cold hardy Asian persimmon, so to speak. Um, something that's a little more suited for fresh eating. Um, it's not just a, you know, turns to goo as soon as you pick it up. Um, and it's maybe a little bit larger, maybe has very few seeds and has got very complex fruity flavors, but that will maybe withstand a little bit colder winters. So the two varieties that have been around the longest are called Nikita's Gift, which is also known as Nikitskaya Bordovaya, they're the same thing, just US and or English and a Ukrainian name. And then Rosa Yanka, which is also known as Russian beauty. The interesting thing is they're very different quality of fruit to them and very different looking trees. And they have different hardiness. 
So Rosa Yanka, I believe, has been successfully grown in like zone 5A. I could be wrong on that. It takes a very long time for it to ripen. So it might be that it's hardy there, but not um, able to ripen the fruit fully. Um, Nikita's gift, however, is very rarely successful um, beyond like zone 6A even. Um, it, it gets a lot of winter dieback, so it is not much hardier than the pure Asian persimmons. And the way it also coincides with the growth form. So Nikita's gift looks a lot more like an Asian persimmon. It's a very short tree, beautiful glossy leaves. Um, the fruits are very large and round and red. And um, my wife's peeking in the window here. She's working on a mini split outside <laughs> so far. <laughs> um, so, uh, but the Rosa Yanka is tall. The leaves look just like American persimmon. You wouldn't know it from another American persimmon, except that the fruit does not drop when it's ripe. It has a flat pumpkin shape like American persimmon. It gets that sort of similar orange color, just a little bit more vibrant and the flavor is a little more fruity, very few seeds, um, and it's a little bit bigger fruit. So. Nikita's gift is me, my, and a lot of my friends' favorite persimmon um, that we can grow around here because it is just, it's, it, it's like this, almost the size of a tomato. It's ruby red when it's ripe, very few seeds, and the flavor is just outstanding. It's just an amazing treat. I'm coming to your place to try some of that. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. Um, we've got an interesting question from Jessica. Jessica is writing from Colorado. So Jessica writes, hi, Susan. I have a small yard in zone five that is very quickly getting filled up with fruit trees. Can hybrid persimmon survive in zone five and be espaliered, espaliered to take up less space? Yes and yes, but it needs to be certain hybrids and know that you might see some death on some of the branch tips in the coldest winters. Um, the best ones I would recommend, the two uh, hybrid persimmons that have known to be the most cold hardy so far that are more readily available right now in the US are Rosa Yanka and one called JTO2 or Mikusu. M-I-K-K-U-S-U. -K -K Those are supposedly, there is someone who grew Mikusu in Illinois that it made it through negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know if that would happen every single time that happens, but um, that is promising. So it may, may be even more cold hardy than Rosa Yanka. Um, but they are both very late ripening types. So I would say Rosa Yanka is a little bit little bit longer season to ripen so um but yes you can grow them growing them on a spalier is possible but persimmons have this interesting habit of they almost self prune which is really nice when you're growing a tall persimmon tree and you don't want to have to worry about pruning it as the branches grow this the lower branches um sort of get sectioned off and then we'll just be dead one year and you just tap them and they fall off. Um, sorry, I thought I had my sound down my phone. Anyway, um, so with Espalier, you'll just have to make sure to maintain and prune off branches that want to go up and above the trellis. If you let them go too tall, I'm guessing they will want to shed off lower branches. But I'm pretty confident that if you manage the Espalier, It'll be just fine, and I think it'd be a very beautiful, um, a very beautiful plant for espalier, especially with the fruit in the fall with no leaves. You'll have this like you know interesting form with a bunch of little Christmas ornaments hanging on it. Well, if any of the listeners do that, please, please send us a picture. I would love to see it. Info at orchardpeople.com. I would love to see how that works out. We've got an interesting question from Ben from Massachusetts. Hello, Darren. Great conversations. I planted a Rossianca hybrid in my garden, zone 5B US, a few years ago, and unfortunately, it did not survive the winter. I purchased another Rossianca last year and was hesitant to plant it in the ground this spring. 
So I put it in a large 15 gallon container and amazingly it flowered for me and set 12 fruits. Do you have any tips on growing persimmons in containers? I'm thinking to keep it as a bonsai with regular root pruning. My fear is the American rootstock will be too vigorous and choke out the plant in a container. Thanks. And so that's from Ben. Great, great question and great observations. I know a number of people who have been growing the Asian persimmons. Most of them are grafted onto American persimmon roots, rootstocks in containers. And a 15 gallon pot should hold that for a long time. I know that um, Japanese do a lot of persimmon bonsai, so they're definitely doable as a bonsai. I think that your plants will be fine. The very worst thing that could happen, I think, is root spiraling long term in the pots, but that could be corrected by, you know, every two or three years, set it on its side, get it out of the pot, and maybe snip a few of those roots that are spiraling. But they're very adaptable. Um, and I think if you keep the top and root ball balanced, you'll be just fine. Now I'll say My one question, more thing. Though, oh, go ahead. Does that mean that he would bring them in in the winter? They'd be indoors? Yes, they would have to be indoors, especially in that cold of a zone. Now, maybe he's had a good, if you had a good luck with it being out, that is fine. And maybe keep trying that. But generally, the roots of plants freezing hard and freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing over the winter is what will kill them. So you would probably have to bring it in. Um, and I'm guessing he is, and that's why he'd have it in the, in the container. Now, I wanted to say one more thing though, because there is something that happens with persimmon grafts and it seems to happen more frequent, frequently with hybrid persimmon grafts onto American rootstock. And I have had a Rosa Yanka, and I've known two other people that have had this happen with Rosa Yanka. So I think it might be a little bit of a quirk of that variety. The graft will grow fine for a year or two or three. And then randomly, sometimes in the spring when it's coming out into leaf, and sometimes mine happened in the middle of the summer or late spring, it'll just completely die to the graft union. And we, a number of us that have had this happen think that it must be some sort of a slight graft incompatibility that happens on some Rosayanka trees. I also know Rosayanka trees that are huge and they're 20 years old and they're doing fine. So I just wanted to mention that, that you might try Rosayanka in the ground in Zen 5B again. Maybe keep one back in a pot and maybe try your hand at grafting um, another one. Um, so. Yeah. Uh, just it's to worth, clarify, worth to just to clarify, if you bring them in, you can actually bring them into your home or do you have to keep them in a bright, sunny garage or but cold, a colder space? So the answer to that is um, yes and no. <laughs> so once they drop their leaves, they do not need any more sun or light to ripen because the leaves are no longer gathering sunlight to make sugars. However, they do need a certain amount of warmth to continue ripening that fruit. So the best thing, and then also the tree, if it is not, if it does not go through enough cold nights, it will not wake up in the spring. So they need the American persimmons and the hybrids need so many chilling days. Um, those of you in very southern climates know about chilling requirements for apples and things that are hard to grow down there. So persimmons need so many days under like 40 degrees before they'll wake back up with a warm spell. So the best thing would be in a, like an unheated garage, somewhere where the root ball won't freeze and thaw, freeze and thaw a lot, um, but that it'll stay somewhat cool. And I would think that even in a garage without light, um, that those fruits would slowly ripen um, over time, so. Fantastic. That's very exciting. It gives us a little more flexibility if we're in a cooler climate. Mm -hmm. So Darren, I want to get into more detail about the top hybrid persimmon cultivars, a little bit more about the people who have, um, you know, changed the world in terms of persimmons and bringing in hybrid persimmons. Um, but we're going to have a few words from our sponsors right now. Are you okay holding the line for a minute? Oh, yeah, totally. Good stuff. All right. Well, we'll be back in just a minute. In the meantime, you are listening to the Urban Forestry Radio Show and Podcast, and it's brought to you 
by the Fruit Tree Care Training website, orchardpeople.com. This is Reality Radio 101, and I'm Susan Poisner, author of the Fruit Tree Care books, Growing Urban Orchards and Grow Fruit Trees Fast. And we'll be back right after this little break. Hi there, you're listening to the Urban Forestry Radio Show and Podcast brought to you by the Fruit Tree Care Training website, orchardpeople.com. This is Reality Radio 101, and I'm your host, Susan Poisner. In the show today, we've been talking to Darren Bender Beauregard of Brambleberry Farm in Indiana. And now back to Darren. So Darren, I had there was a, another comment that came in before the break we were talking about could you grow your persimmon tree in a big pot and then bring it in over the winter? So Ben wrote an email here and Ben is from Massachusetts. And he says, I keep my tree dormant in the winter in the garage with my fig and pomegranate trees. So what do you think about that? I'm glad to hear that that's working well. Um, and it's perfect to pair with some of those other subtropical fruits that we can't quite grow outside here, but that will do well in pots and you can get fresh subtropical fruits um, in cold climates. So that's awesome. So tell me a little bit. Now, I know that there is a number of people here in North America that have been working really hard at helping to bring hybrid uh, persimmons to North America. One of them that comes to mind is Cliff England. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Cliff England, for anyone that has ever met Cliff or been to his place, knows that he's one of the most generous, uh, amazing people uh, you'll meet. And I am convinced he has the largest collection of persimmon cultivars and also pawpaw cultivars in the entire US, possibly the world. So Cliff is just an amazing person with an amazing place and he has connections all around the world. So he has been collecting a lot of the hybrid persimmons over the years. But in addition to that, he has been working or did work with a man from Louisiana State University named David Laverne, who unfortunately passed a number of years ago. David, being down in Louisiana, was in a very warm climate where mostly Asian persimmons would grow. American persimmons will grow there, but um, it's, you, since you can grow the Asian ones, most people are not spending much time on the American persimmons. So David was a plant breeder, and he was interested in making hybrid crosses between American persimmon and Asian persimmon. So he made these crosses, controlled crosses by hand with pollen from one going to the flowers of the other. And he then found himself in a bind where he wanted to find varieties that would be cold hardy because why else would we cross the two? But he was in a very warm climate. So he um, connected with Cliff England and Cliff and him had an agreement together where David would breed some of these crosses and send the seeds to Cliff. Cliff then grew them out, hundreds and hundreds of them, probably thousands. I'm not sure in numbers. I've seen his flats when I was down there um, of the seedlings. And every year he had new ones. Um, and then Cliff has a beautiful large farm and he set about just planting these seedlings out on in orchard rows. These seedlings, I think, are now probably the oldest ones are probably at like 10 or 12 years old, maybe even older than that. Um, and they're motive, many of them are bearing fruit. Now, as you can imagine, many of them were male. And so, you know, those aren't going to make any fruit, but they could be useful for, you know, further breeding. So I think he He's kept the lumber of males that might be useful, and I think he's grafted on to many of them just to make more productive space. But he has been it's, seeing, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. Yeah, so the result I'm guessing is going to be an incredibly, because you're growing these seedlings, the result will be incredibly diverse, different colors of fruit, for instance, different flavors. I'm sure are some of them not very tasty. I mean, like what kind of diversity would you get? 
Yes, and I've been there when they ripe been ripening, um, not for the whole season. I'd love to be fun to stay down there for a month and just watch them. But uh, he posts, if you want to go to his Facebook um, page, it's um, England, England's Orchard and Nursery. Um, the website is nuttrees.net. He's posts a lot of pictures as they're ripening and get a lot of information there. But they are all over the place in terms of size and color and shape and flavor. Some are pretty bland, not that exciting, and some are just delicious. There's one down there that is barely similar to the hachia type persimmons that you buy in the grocery store that are Asian. They're just delicious. They're my favorites. And there was one there that had that acorn shape and had that flavor. And so I'm, um, I have a graft of that that I'm looking forward to start fruiting here. The other thing about his planting that is very interesting is that we had the polar vortex winter a handful of years ago and his orchard got down I think to negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit which is the coldest had gotten there in maybe history I forget but it was very very singular event and while it was terribly sad for Cliff because he lost so many of his grafted trees it also gave him the opportunity to see which ones were survivors of that sort of cold. So now he has, you know, a known number of hybrid and I'm not sure a few Asian varieties made it through that as well, uh, but mostly hybrid varieties that we know can take that sort of cold. So it's, a, it's an amazing thing happening there. And we're just gonna see more and more of those pop out of the woodwork as, as his orchard gets more mature. So we've got an email from Paul. Paul is from Northern Michigan, zone 5A4B. Uh, so here's what Paul writes. Been listening to the podcast, first time listening live. Welcome, Paul. Thank you for tuning in. Um, so Paul writes, heirloom apples have been my focus, but I've been growing a large variety of fruits. I've seen unspecified American persimmon cultivars, cultivars sold at some local stores for wildlife purposes. If I decide to try persimmon, would it be better to graft a known cultivar? Can you touch base on your method for grafting a little bit more? So for instance, bench graft versus field graft, bud graft versus whip and tongue, sources of rootstock and scion wood. So that is from Paul in Northern Michigan. All right. Yeah, I would be a little bit wary of buying the wildlife trees at the local nurseries. They could be a variety that's very cold hardy. They could also be one that is less, especially if they don't state the cultivar. So you're much better off finding ones that have done really well in colder zones, especially that are earlier ripening and grafting them on to American rootstock. So uh, the sources of these um, sources of rootstock are, there's many nurseries that sell seedling American persimmon rootstocks. Your state nursery may in fact even have some. Uh, that's one place where a lot of hobbyists and backyard people get their rootstocks in our area. Indiana and Kentucky grow thousands and thousands of persimmon seedlings and sell them through a DNR nursery program that subsidizes the purchase of trees, native trees for home landowners to plant. So you can get them for like here as low as 30 cents a tree, but you buy them in bundles of 100. So they may be available in Michigan, I don't know for sure, but if not, there are many nurseries in Michigan that grow bare root trees that I believe have them. Um, I would check with um, Alpha Nursery I've bought from in the past and had good luck with them. Um, i blanking on some of the other ones, but Michigan has a lot of nurseries going. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing would be to order seeds or get seeds from somewhere. So there are some places that sell seeds and you could grow your own rootstocks like in place where you want them. Just plant the seeds in the fall um let them come up and then one nice thing about that is you'll see if there's any that any of them that are very sensitive to cold they will die out over your winters and you'll know not to mess with those individuals the remaining ones do you know will have gone through a winter or two before you graft them and so also you did i don't know if you mentioned uh the types of grafting that would be most mm -hmm. effective 
So they persimmons are actually very easy to graph, but like I said earlier, the most important thing is to wait till they have wait till the rootstock has leafed out almost fully, in my opinion. I think it has something to do with just being warm and having the rootstock be well woken up before it will fuse the graft. I tried grafting persimmons and even pawpaws when they were very dormant and had low success. And then I, you know, my one of my orchard mentors, um, Donald Compton here, he talked about you really want to wait till they've leafed out. And I've done, I've had very little problem with that. I've done, I do mostly whip and tongue grafting for most of my grafts. Um, I've done side veneer grafting works very well for them. Bud grafting works. I haven't done much of it because I don't mess with bud grafting as often, um, but they seem to really take grafts pretty well and pretty readily. Um, so I would just try whatever technique you're comfortable with. And the main thing is just wait until um, you have good growth on your rootstock and you have dormant sign wood in your refrigerator. So, so we've got another, oh, sorry, we've got another email from Mark, and this is on exactly that topic. Mark, again, is from Quebec, Zone 4B in Canada. Okay, um, he, so he says, I'm experimenting with persimmons and have mixed results. All grafted meter and molar trees died, but their root stalks are alive and kicking even after two minus 31 degrees Celsius winters in ground. Since the root stalks are sending multiple suckers up and those suckers are leafing out well, should I consider grafting the suckers um, with the, the female meter and molar again? Or should he instead try some other cultivars? So basically he's saying, should I try again with the exact same cultivar just using the rootstock or is it a good idea to try a different cultivar if it didn't work the first time? Um, I would say yes and also try new ones. And yes, it's totally fine and great to graft onto root suckers. Our whole three acre field is almost a giant network of persimmon roots. And so they come up whenever we don't mow and we have a forest of persimmons and they'll grow like six feet tall in a single season. So I can let those go and I go out and I do field grafting onto them and have really good success. So, but I would say meter and muller are often talked about as being these cold hardy varieties, but I believe that there are many other varieties that are probably even more cold hardy than those. So I would say maybe try those again, but also try some others. And again, check with Buzz Ferber. He would, he would have some of the best opinions I know on which ones have been working the best for him up there. Now, another thing you might try, and uh, it's just kind of a risk and it takes a long time, but you might try leaving one sucker from each of your individual rootstocks to grow out on its own. They have shown you that they are cold hardy in your area. The question is whether they're all male or some of them will be female. And then if they are female, will that fruit have time to ripen? It will be any good. But um, the interesting thing is a lot of persimmon rootstock that is grown is actually from improved cultivars. Because as you can imagine, people aren't going out and just gathering wild persimmons for seed. They're getting them from places that make persimmon pulp or grow commercial quantities of American persimmons. And they're gonna be growing grafted, um, grafted improved types. So you're probably already growing something that genetically is much higher chance of being a quality fruit than just a random wild seedling. And if it's shine that is cold hardy, I would say, yeah, leave, leave one of each of them and see what it does can't hurt. Such a great idea. Just give it a try. We've got an email here from Oscar from New York. Oscar says, hey, Susan, just writing to say hi. Thank you for putting out such great content. Enjoying another wonderful show. Oh, Oscar, that makes my heart sing. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask in terms of you said to leave, you know, one sucker, let's see what happens. Does Will it produce fruit? How long does it actually take to produce fruit on these persimmon plants. I had a whole bunch of comments on Facebook. One was from Becky in Southern Iowa. Becky writes, I have three persimmon trees that are probably 10 to 13 years old. And this is the first year I see fruit. So I'm excited. Um, so 10 to 13 years, really? Is that how long we have to wait? 
That's I'd say that's a pretty like on the end of the general window. They can produce as early as five to six years from sprouting from seed, but that's it's generally the rule of thumb for most fruits, including persimmon, is seven years is when you can count on if they're growing well um, and they feel like they want to make flowers and fruit. So um, that's probably when you'd, you'd be looking and you'd be wanting to look for not just for fruit, but look for the flower because the male and female flowers are very different and that's how you'll tell the sex of the tree um i see many people say i've had this thing in the ground for you know 15 years and it never makes fruit and i go out there and i see all these little male flower stems that stay on the trees actually so you can identify them i can identify them any season and tell you if it's male or female if it's old enough to fruit but you'll be able to tell and then you can say oh the male well it's a male i'll just go and graft onto that um, and then you'll get fruit now so you said you, you're waiting a long time if it's a seedling mm -hmm. if you are to graft a branch mm -hmm. onto that seedling tree do we still have such a long wait until it produces fruit how many no. years would we have to wait no just as in almost all fruits grafting reduces the time to fruiting there's some kind of a genetic memory time memory in that tissue that you're grafting that says oh i'm a mature plant so we've actually seen plants fruit from the graft the very first year sometimes our flower buds on the shoots that are coming out so sometimes the answer is one year <laughs> but wow. more most likely it's two to three years um, and it also depends on the cultivar so some cultivars are very precocious there's one called 100-46 which is one jerry layman bred and that one seems to just make loads of big fruit on very young grafts, which actually can be a problem with breaking off branches and over, over um, working the tree with how much fruit it's trying to make. So, wow, so you have to thin those, I guess. I must say grafting for me is a relatively new skill. I've created a course with Steph Roth of Silver Creek Nursery. And uh, in the process, I've learned to graft. Our students have learned to graft. And it is so empowering to know how to propagate trees in that way. And it is so fun and addictive. So there you go. If anybody wants to learn to graft, if I can do it, you can do it. And uh, check out my course at learn.orchardpeople.com. You'll have fun. Um, be, careful. A couple... be, be careful. You might make it into a profession like I did. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It is just too exciting. When you, when you see your graphs take, when you realize you just you need to understand the science, you just have to have some basic skills. And then once your confidence grows, it's like, I can do this. I can do anything. It's really fun. Um, I'm going to throw, we've got to have our contest in just a minute, but I want to throw in a few other comments that were from Facebook. Kevin from Florida uh, commented, um, Kevin grows all sorts of stuff, and he says, persimmon season is the best. Non-astringents are amazing dried or on the grill, too. My halves are, or my favorites, are Fuyu and Guillombo. And he says, I marinate chunks with other veggies and put them on skewers. So yeah. good. Oh, my yeah. gosh. That sounds great. I would never have thought of that. That's have you tried idea. that? Yeah, because they're very subtle sweetness. They'd be perfect with zucchini and other things. Yeah. That'd be great. Okay. So, so also Catherine, Catherine has read my mind. Uh, I was going to ask you, Darren, so I'm going to be putting up a video of this uh, conversation with all the pictures you shared with me. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say, do you have an image of a male blossom? Well, Catherine read my mind and sent me an image, which is, I think, a male blossom. I'll send it to you to confirm. So in hopefully in the video version, which folks will find on YouTube, I will have hopefully images of the blossoms. Do you have female blossom pictures too, Darren, that I can share? I might. They should be fairly readily available on the internet. Um, the main thing to know is the female blossoms will have a little tiny green persimmon in the middle of it, which is the ovary that hasn't been fertilized yet. And they are singular. So the female flowers are only one per stem. Male flowers are, look like little bells, or almost like little blueberry flowers, downward hanging bells, and they are in clusters of two to four or five per stem. Oh, so. Okay, well, I'm going to send this picture, Catherine's pictures, to you, and we'll make sure that it is identified as the correct thing. Um, 
Okay, let's see if I can throw in one more comment that I really liked. Let's see, there were so many great comments here. Um, Isaac from Central New York writes, a good American persimmon has unparalleled flavor. And Justin wrote to say, they're like a taste of autumn that you had no idea you were missing your entire life. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I have yeah. to eat some. <laughs> yeah, they are. And they're right. The American persimmon, even though they're not as commonly used for fresh eating, they have an extremely distinct flavor. And it's got, to me, it's got like a little bit of hints of pump cooked pumpkin in it. Um, my first one I ate, I felt like I had these candies as a kid that were like little wax soda bottles that had orange, very fake orange flavored syrup in them. And I don't know why, but they reminded me of that. So they have a little bit of a citrus tone to them. They're, they're pretty neat, but very messy. So we're going to wrap up the show in just a minute. But before we do, I want to say hello to the listeners that wrote me this month. Hello to you, Craig, Ken, Rita, Gail, and James. Lovely to hear from you during the month. And I really want to thank you, Darren, for coming to join me on the show today. You are uh, just a, a wonderful, wonderful resource. You've got so much knowledge and passion about persimmons. And um, maybe you'll come back again and we can talk about them. I feel like there's more that we could explore in terms of the mm -hmm. science and propagation. What do you think? Would you come back again someday? I think I can do that. That sounds there's so much more to know about persimmons, that's for sure. I think so. Well, thank you so much. And to all my listeners, I really appreciate you tuning in today and every time I do a show. So if you love this show, there are three things that you can do right now. You can go to the Orchard People YouTube page and subscribe. And that way, every time I put out a new video, so all of these audio podcasts are going to be turned into videos with lots of images. Every time I put out a new video, you will be notified if you subscribe to my YouTube page, Orchard People YouTube page. The second thing you can do is go to Apple Podcasts or your local podcatcher and subscribe to this podcast. Every time a new show comes out, you will be notified. And finally, if you can, post a podcast review. It makes a world of difference to me and it helps this podcast to be discovered by other people. So that's all for the show today. If you want to listen to it again or download other episodes, go to orchardpeople.com slash podcasts. That's all for now. I hope you'll join me again next month when we're going to dig into another great topic. I'll see you then. Bye for now.